Welcome everyone to the inaugural session of Women Transforming Our Nuclear Legacy on the United Nations Day for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons. Thank you to all of you women and girls who are joining us across many time zones from around the world. We have registered as of a few minutes ago over 180 women from over 29 countries, including women from seven of the nine nuclear armed states, the United States, Russia, Great Britain, France, India, Pakistan, and Israel. Mm. And we hold space here in this circle for nuclear armed China and nuclear armed North Korea. We're honored to have an extraordinary group of mentors with us who are all dedicating their lives to transforming our nuclear legacy. And we're truly honored to have all of you with us today. Many of you are taking your first step today, joining us to claim your seat at the table, to change our nuclear story, to eliminate nuclear weapons. Thank you so much to all of you for being here. Really blessed. Now I want to welcome my dear friend and teacher, beloved elder in our community here on the island of Kauai, Kumuhula Puna Dawson, who will open our session with a blessing for peace. Puna shares the spirit of aloha wherever she goes, and she travels the world sharing aloha and building peace between the peoples of the Hawaiian Islands and the peoples of other countries. Welcome, dear Auntie Puna, aloha, and mahalo for being with us here today. Please share your blessing. Mahalo. Agahai, lokai, olu, olu, ha, 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 ho, nu. Akahai to be kind, lokai to be this family, olu, olu to be able to listen and hear, Ha'a ha'a to be humble and recognize that in this world we need everyone, the gifts of everyone. And ahonui, the patience necessary to do what we must do in these challenging times. The idea and the thought of coming together, we as women of the world and all those that help us to do what we must do. We do it in the name of aloha. We do it in the name of peace. We are like a blanket that will be a breath that covers the earth with absolute pono, absolute truth. We are the blanket of peace that will be breathed throughout the world, one to another, holding hands, opening our hearts, and most especially acknowledging that the world cannot be a place that will support nuclear weapons and weapons of destruction. Women were put and brought here to be the catalyst of truth, peace, appreciation, trust, and so we will do this with one breath. So please, everyone, put your hands in front of your mouth, like I am. Breathe into it. That ha. Lift it up. And now all of our ancestry is talking to one another with one thought, one intention. We carry the history of our ancestors at this time. So let they be a part of this celebration and blanket of peace. In the name of Aloha. Aloha. Mahalo. Thank you, dear auntie, for that beautiful blessing. Thank you for honoring us today with that and sharing aloha and setting the intention for peace for this session. The theme today is awakening to action, claiming our seat at the table to eliminate nuclear weapons. 
why am I here? Why have I invited all of you here to join me today? Because this is personal for me. After the Cold War ended, I thought I could stop worrying about nuclear war. That all changed for me in 2017 when I was working on a film, interviewing top experts, dozens of them, on US-Russian relations and nuclear dangers. Pretty much everyone I spoke to awakened me to today's staggering nuclear danger. But the two people who had the greatest impact on me were former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev and our US former Secretary of Defense, William Perry. Secretary Perry said to me, we are at a greater risk today of a nuclear catastrophe than at any time in history. And most people are blissfully unaware of this danger. And then he said, we are sleepwalking into a nuclear catastrophe and we must wake up. I realized at that moment that I've been sleepwalking since the end of the Cold War. And I came home from those interviews at the height of the fire and fury in December of 2017 between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. And nuclear tensions were particularly high here in Hawaii because we knew that we had been marked on North Korea's nu nuclear map of death that we were a target. And we were getting instructions from our government on how to prepare for a nuclear attack and how to survive a nuclear attack. And then on the morning, a few weeks later, of January 13th, 2018, I was one of over a million people in Hawaii who got this message on my cell phone. Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. At first it was, is this real? So we started trying to call 911, but everybody was trying to call 911, so we couldn't get through. And then my partner, Bruce said, I don't know if this is real or not, but I'm going to go get the girls. Our younger daughters were seven miles away in the town of Kapa'a. And I said, well, wait a second. We need a plan if it is real, where we're gonna meet. I don't, I don't wanna be separated. And he said, call me in the car, we'll figure it out. So at that moment, I thought, who do I know who's gonna know? And I remembered my friend, a journalist here, Felicia, and I started to try to call her, text her, check her Facebook page, because I knew that she would know. Everybody takes her call, and she's always the first to know everything. But I, I didn't hear from her right away, and finally she called me back, and she said, Cynthia, the county is telling us to take shelter. And at that moment, I thought, my God, this is real. And then it was, well, where do we go? We decided to shelter in a cave, a meditation cave on a neighbor's property. And then it was, well, what do I take with me? And I looked at my phone and I had 12% charge. And I thought, oh. and so I thought, well, I'll get my phone charger. And then I thought, well, is there electricity in the cave? Well, there are lights there, so hopefully there's a, an outlet. And I started throwing things into a bag, my computer, my computer charger, my passport, my purse, and then a shawl to wrap around myself and leggings if for, to protect, protect from radiation. And then it was food for my family. We're supposed to have enough food for 14 days for each person and water. And then I thought I've done nothing to prepare for this, nothing to prepare my family. I had two bottles of water, which I threw into the bag and a bunch of bananas and I jumped in the car. And it was only when I got into the car that I thought of my eldest daughter in LA. She had left a few days before, and I thought, I've got to let her know. I've got to call her to say goodbye. And so I started to try to reach her, and she wasn't picking up. And I parked the car near the hill leading up to the cave, and I still didn't hear from her. And then just at the foot of the steps to the cave, she picked up. And I said, Mackenzie, I don't know if you've heard or not, but we've all got a message on our cell phone that we're going to be hit by a nuclear missile here we're going to shelter in the cave. And I'm gonna call you again from the cave if, if I can. And I just want you to know that I love you. I love you. And she said, mom, I love you too. And it was at that moment that 
Time stopped. I froze. I didn't want to let her go. I thought, am I ever going to hear her voice again? Is this the last time I'm ever going to connect with her? And then it was, wait a second, what if this isn't just about her and me? What if this isn't about one nuclear missile from North Korea? But what if this is the beginning of one of those accidental wars that all the experts were telling me about, Gorbachev, Secretary Perry in the interviews? What if this is the beginning of the end of everyone and everything we know and love and cherish on this earth? And at that moment, I heard Mackenzie say, Mom, go, go. And so I said, I love you. And I started running up the steps. And then I ran up the hill above the steps. And as I got to the door of the cave to open it, it opened. And it was my neighbor, Colleen. And she was smiling. And she held up her phone. And she said, it was a false alarm. It took 38 minutes for us to find out that it wasn't real. Um, and even with everything that I knew about nuclear weapons, Hiroshima, nuclear fallout, nuclear winter, everything I knew, nuclear war was never real or imaginable to me until I went through those 38 minutes. And now it's inside of me, it's, it's visceral, it's in my gut, and it's always gonna be with me, it's here with me until we eliminate nuclear weapons. And so that's why I'm here today. That's why I've convened all of you today. This is why I've started this project. And this is why I am so personal for me. Thank you all again for being here. I'm so grateful. So today, in today's session, we're gonna be planting many seeds. This is the first in a series of 10 sessions and we'll be going much deeper on all of the seeds planted today in future sessions. And I wanna express my gratitude to the Plowshares Fund Women in Women's Initiative for their generous support in making this project possible. Plowshares has been leading the quest to eliminate nuclear weapons since they got started in the 1980s. And I want to honor Plowshares founder, Sally Lilienthal, who dedicated her life and heart and soul to this. We wouldn't be here without Sally, and we wouldn't be here without Plowshares. And we also wouldn't be here without four young women who inspired this project. project. Alida Gonzalez, Mahina Alexander, Aida Eskrima Kiva, and Keiko Tamaki. Just over a year ago, all within about a week, each of these women came to me independently of one another and asked for this program to be born. They didn't know each other, and none of them had ever done anything about nuclear weapons before. So I want to start with you, Alita. Dear Alita, you were the first to plant this seed. One day, you came over and you said mm -hmm. to me, will you mentor me? Mm -hmm. You've helped so much since then. And I want you to look at how your seed has grown. Thank wow. You. Thank you, dear. Cynthia, thank you so much. I, I'm so honored and I feel like just thinking back to that, you know, the, that day, but even before that, when I met you, you've been such an inspiration to me. And, you know, we all need mentors in our life if we're going to continue forward and um, grow to be the best that we can be and, and learn how to share our gifts, but also how to support, you know, good things that are happening in this world. And you've inspired me so much with this. Um, I didn't really know a lot about the threat of nuclear weapons or what's been going on. And um, you really have opened my eyes and my heart and inspired me that we can do some good things. And um, I'm just speechless too, because the story you just shared, I was there in Kauai and I, I feel so emotional because, you know, that um, what you're recounting really helps all of us catch in in, in this moment to how it feels um, to really be aware of that threat and our families and our lives and what matters. And um, it's thank just, you. thank you. It's, so yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you. We love you. <laughs>
Mahina, there you are. You were next. You came to me with tears in your eyes and you said, I want to help, but can I do anything? And then you were crying and you said, I never thought I could have a voice on something like this. And I said, Mahina, if nuclear weapons can destroy all of us, we all have a role to play in making sure it never happens. And at that moment, you claimed your seat at the table and you never looked back. You've educated yourself, you've read everything I've sent you and you've asked for more. And you've just shared this program with your 200,000 Instagram followers. That's the way we build a movement. That's the way we get this done. And now you have a very personal reason for doing this. Please share your joy with us. The little beam. <laughs> Beautiful. Bless yeah. you and bless your little one, Mahina. Thank you. Thank you for all you're doing. You're Thank amazing. You so much. We love you so much. Mm. So much. You already know. <laughs> love you. <laughs> love you. Aida. You reached out to me on Facebook and you said you wanted to help. You work at the Global Fund for Women for Adolescent Girls' Rights. And you said, Cynthia, you can't limit the age. You have to bring girls into this. And you were so right. And so girls are now a part of this. And we are collaborating with you on a session for girl leaders from around the world in partnership with the amazing women at Girl Security. So thank you so much for what you've done. You also shared with me something personal that you reached out to me because you grew up in Kazakhstan, that your mother and grandmother had had breast cancer. And there's an ongoing worry in your family about the legacy of nuclear testing in Kazakhstan. You told me you were trying to get pregnant last summer and thought it might never happen because of the possible inherited nuclear legacy. And now you have the miracle of baby Aditya. So thank you. And bless you and bless baby Adita. Baby Adita. Thank you so much. Honestly, thank you so much for being open to, to the changes to the programs that you have been working on and for being so welcoming to the girls. And I really do believe that girls will help us build much stronger safety and security around the world. So thank you very much for being open and thank you for leading this work. Thank you. Keiko, you came to me and said, Cynthia, I want to learn. I want the facts. I want to understand. I want to become a voice for this work. And then you told me that your mother had been a Japanese anti-nuclear activist. And within a month, you were taking up her legacy and you were on your way to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where you were making a film about and with our friend, Hawaii artist, Makana. And you two were inspired to create a beautiful song together, Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes. Please share the story of this song with us. Yes, thank you so much, Cynthia. You have been such a, a teacher and a friend to me, and I, I am so grateful. Um, going on this journey with Makana was just really a way, after meeting you and, and learning with you, was really a way to get closer to the story and to the history of the atomic bombings in Japan on a grander scale. And, you know, when I went there, it was just a tiny glimpse into this, the destruction, the reality of the destruction of nuclear weapons. And that experience of walking through the memorial and the ground zero and being, being fully immersed and surrounded by the stories and the artifacts, it, it really just cut so deeply. Um, and being of Japanese ancestry, I, I have always known the story, the famous story of Sarako and the paper cranes, but actually going to the museum and spending time with like seeing her kimono and her, her precious belongings and, and the stories and the poems and the artwork from the children, it, it really gave me this uh, visceral and tangible reality. And so um, it really struck a chord for us, Makana and I, and we just wanted to keep asking ourselves, what can we do? And, and I believe that culture and art, as you and Makana have done in Russia, is really the bridge for us to expand on this message. 
And so this song that we wrote together in Japan is, is a Japanese and English song written about Sarako and her story. And you, you um, involved a girls choir from Nagasaki. Yes, that is correct. We got to meet with a, a girls school, a high school, and we joined them on their peace committee. And they, uh, Makana performed Hawaiian music slack key for them. So again, it was just exchange of culture and they ended up also singing the girls choir and, and ended up singing with us this song. Um, Tom, could you play the song for us? Sarako was only two years old On the day the atom bomb exploded In a sea of fire all around Mother found her baby on the ground She always had a smile But a silent sickness grew within her From the day the bomb exploded near her Now she falls to the floor She tries to hide the pain As her fingers fold a paper crane Folding cranes until her final hour As she prays for life with all her power Sadako rest in
<laughs> um, believe it or not, I mean, of course, McCona is a world-class musician, so writing with him was very easy because he's such a magnificent uh, musician, but that was the first time I ever wrote a song. And so um, I just, I don't know, it's amazing to, <laughs> to see these, the ways that we can be creative and use art to un unfold and continue a story move it forward into the next generations and and i think storytelling is the way to really spread this awareness and this message so thank you so much for all the support cynthia you really like continue to to water these seeds in me and all of us thank you I'm so grateful that you've taken up your mother's legacy. And I know she's really proud of you. And I just want to say that we're looking forward to welcoming you back in our session on storytelling for change. It's a future session with your film. And I also just want to say, may Sadako's prayer for peace be realized. Thank you so much. Okay. So, why women and why now? Since the dawn of the nuclear age, women have been at worst completely or at best largely shut out of national security planning, decision making, and policy making. Today, women are still grossly underrepresented in nuclear policy, negotiation, and peace processes. And yet, when women are involved, peace becomes more possible and peace agreements more enduring. That's what the research shows. We continue to create ever more deadly weapon systems that can, that can annihilate us many times over. And we already have enough nuclear weapons to destroy ourselves many, many times over. It's clear that the old ways of doing things are not working. Today, it's an existential imperative that women come forward to lead, to change our nuclear policy and eliminate nuclear weapons. Excluding women, half of the human race, from this conversation, for much of the nuclear age, has brought us to the brink of possible extinction. Now we're going to hear from the extraordinary mentors, amazing women, we have with us today, all dedicating their lives to transforming our nuclear legacy. These women are leading in a new way, all showing us a pathway forward to peace and disarmament. And these women are welcoming us, inviting us to join them, roll up our sleeves, get to work and get this done. There's not a moment to spare. Keikishan Basu is a UN human rights champion and founder president of Green Hope Foundation. She's a peace and social justice crusader, author, musician, and passionate advocate for the sustainable development goals, nuclear disarmament, children's rights, and gender equality. She is the youngest recipient of Canada's top 25 women of influence and winner of the 2016 International Children's Peace Prize. Her organization works in 16 countries to empower young people and women, especially those in vulnerable communities in the sustainable development process. She just received the inaugural Voices of Youth Award for her work to educate and engage thousands of youth around the world to abolish nuclear weapons. Welcome, Keikishan. Thank Everything you so much. Every time I read your bio, I want to cry because I'm just so blown away. Thank you for being here. You're so inspiring. Thank Mar you so much for having me. Marjan Nurjan is the coordinator for the Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament for CIS countries and the Outreach Educational Coordinator for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Youth Group. She is also coordinator of the Youth Network of Abolition 2000, the Global Civil Society Network to Eliminate Nuclear Weapons. Marjan was chosen by the president of the UN General Assembly as the youth speaker for the 2017 UN high level meeting on nuclear disarmament and was the initiator and leader of the international youth delegation to the high level conference at the UN in New York. She was named a NOTA OC scholar for peace and security in 2019. Marjan, we're so honored to have you with us. I know you have many events going on with all of your organizations today and you're in a very late time zone. Thank you for being here and doing all your amazing work. Mary Olson is a biologist and founder of the Gender Radiation Impact Project. 
While pursuing research work, she suffered contamination with radioactivity used in the lab. Seven years later, she was called to step up when she heard the US federal government was moving to deregulate a large share of radioactive waste. Her job for the next 28 years was to monitor, educate, and advocate for better radioactive waste policy. Her work led her to research biological sex as a factor in harm caused by radiation. And this led her all the way to work on the global treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. Mary, welcome to you. We're so thrilled that you're here with us to share information that is really existential for every one of us here. Thank you for the work you do and for being here today to share this work. Thank you, Cynthia. It's, it feels really good to be here. Jessica Slate is the program director at Global Zero, the international movement for the elimination of all nuclear weapons, where she provides research and analysis on issues relating to the nuclear risk reduction and our disarmament and helps coordinate Global Zero policy initiatives. Global Zero has come up with the most comprehensive step-by-step -step pathway to get us to zero nuclear weapons that I know of. They are showing us a pathway forward for nuclear armed states to give up their nuclear weapons. Welcome to you, Jessica, and thank you thank so you. much for all you do. Thank you, Cynthia, for having me. It's an honor. Natalia Jurina is a specialist on nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation based in Mexico City, where she works as the research and education officer at OPENAL, the Agency for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in Latin America and the Caribbean. She is also coordinator for Eastern Europe at the Preparatory Commission for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization Youth Group. Natalia graduated with a degree in International Relations and Affairs from the National Nuclear Research University, MIFI, in Moscow and previously worked in Moscow at the embassy to Peru for the Russian Pet Federation. And now I'm gonna start with, welcome, Natalia. Thank you so much for having me, Cynthia. It is such an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you for all you do and all you hold. Mary, we wanna start with you. Could you please tell us why gender matters in the atomic age, the heart and soul of your work. Why is this personal for every one of us, for you, for me, for every woman and every girl present with us in this session, for every female on the planet today? Because it's in our bodies, Cynthia, and we'll go to my slides. I'm gonna move fairly quickly through some pictures and everyone can find them on my website, which is genderandradiation.org. We've been talking about nuclear weapons as if they haven't happened. The first two weapons were used by my government, the United States, to destroy two cities in Japan in August of 1945, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But over 2,000 detonations have occurred on our planet. This is a map of the ground zeros. And these were called tests, the other you know, besides Hiroshima and Nagasaki called tests, but each of these places was somebody's home. Next slide. And the radioactivity goes up in clouds until they went to below ground testing, but even then some clouds were generated and radioactivity goes. And disproportionately, we're going to talk about how gender, sex, biological sex, makes women and girls more impacted, but also indigenous people and people of color have been disproportionately impacted by the choices of dominant societies of where to test, by their lands being where uranium has been located, by industrial societies choosing to put nuclear factories in low income and people of color communities. And so the Black Lives Matter movement and all movements to protect people are so important, including this effort. Next slide. Next slide. Up, oh, go back. Radiation is invisible. We can't hear it, smell it, taste it but we can see the damage it has done to these chromosomes. And that is the point that radiation primarily um, impacts and damages our genetic material and our cells. Next.
when the damage is to reproductive uh, cells, eggs and sperm, deformations are one impact. More common though, are the loss of the pregnancy or the reproductive event for plants, animals, all forms of life are impacted by radiation. And in human beings, this contributes to infertility and to not reproducing because of uncertainty. And I know that there are people on this call who've experienced this and my heart goes out. Next slide. So the one form of impact that the United States government pays attention to is not the non-cancer effects, and there are many besides reproductive impacts. Our government here in the United States and those that follow it around the world only look at cancer as an impact and measure safety around cancer risk. So the rest of what I'm gonna talk about is really focusing on cancer. So in this picture, we see the radiation impact coming in on the left, hitting a cell, breaking the DNA, resulting in an abnormal cell that sits and waits, and then at some point in the future, may or may not become a tumor. Before I say anything else, I have to tell you that our bodies are amazing. We heal these damages all the time, day in, day out. Not every radiation exposure results in cancer. But as a result, we don't know which one does and which one doesn't, and that is why cancer is studied in large groups of people looking at statistically significant uh, groups that do or don't get sick. Next slide. Next, yeah. Okay, so Again, our, the United States government and those that follow it assume that every single cancer in any single person is happening in an adult male. The adult male is an envelope defined as reference man. I'm not going to read all those details, but there's a specific definition. He's 20 to 30 years old. He's a specific height, a specific weight. He is European and Caucasian in his lifestyle. And that means that this, this man does not correspond to many, many men on the planet. And he certainly doesn't correspond to non-men. Next slide. So at a significant point in my life, a woman asked me, does radiation harm women more than men? And uh, it took me a while to answer this question, but when I did engage, it was with the data in this blue report called the Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation. I did not collect any data. It was all published by the National Academy of Science in the United States, and the data all comes from um, the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I must pause for a moment and acknowledge the horror that my own government chose to destroy cities full of people in an indiscriminate weapon in this way and acknowledge that I use the data from that event and that the only reason I use the data from that event is because the only other large groups of people that have been followed and tracked are all reference men. They're the atomic workers who built the nuclear weapons. They're all male. And they're all adult. So if we want to look at the impacts of radiation in large groups, this is really the only da data set we have. And honestly, we don't want another one. So I always take a moment to apologize for this history and apologize that I use the data. But what's in it is so important for all of us that we'll go to the next slide and hear that story. Next slide. We already knew that radiation is more harmful to children. Their bodies are smaller, the dose, same dose is a bigger impact, and their cells are dividing, and so their DNA is more vulnerable. Next slide. But what we didn't know, and is in that, the numbers in that blue report, and in the lives and deaths of the survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, is this finding. That of the people who were children in 1945, 
The study is composed of age groups that are birth to five years old, five to 10 years old. And in 2006, when the report was published, we had 60 years of tracking cancers and cancer deaths. And so looking at the youngest people, the children of Hiroshima and Nagasaki who were exposed and survived, for every boy who survived and later got cancer, two girls later got cancer at some point in their life. We're not talking childhood cancer here, we're talking lifetime cancers. A doubling in biological research is just a huge flashing light and siren going off. The first time we see this is in the 2006 report. Next slide. Next, yeah, thanks. So looking across the age groups, there was also a measurable difference between men who were exposed and women who were exposed in 1945. For every two men who died of cancer, three women died. And this finding holds across the adult group and changed my activity in the field. I don't go to contaminated places anymore. Next slide. Okay, here's the same information in graphic form. We're just gonna stay just a moment here to say that across the bottom is all the different age groups that people were when they were exposed to these big flashes of external gamma radiation in 1945. And the vertical axis is increased um, cancers and the whole thing is reshuffled like cards in a deck if epidemiology does that, to a single dose rate. That's not reality, but you can do that with a data set. And so here we see the difference. Blue line is males, pink line is females. Across the entire span, pink line never crosses blue line. Females are more impacted in every age group, but the difference is biggest when they were exposed as young children. And there you see that doubling over on the left-hand side. Next slide. Here I have given you what the decision makers of the world see. They only see reference man. They only see data from a reference man, that 25 to 30 year old male where that green circle is. Everything else is invisible. No information about males of other ages, no information about females. Next slide. I've added the pink, uh, back please, back. Tom, yeah, thanks. I've added the pink X because in fact, we need to have new approach to radiation protection. We need to put all of our protection based on that big pink X where the little girls are. And when I heard the song of the thousand paper cranes today, I realized that is Sadako there. That is the age group that she was part of. Now, next slide. So we have a life cycle and little girls are an inextricable link in that life cycle. And we've tended to view it as a single circle, but it's actually a figure eight because we see so many gendered differences in our um, lives from birth to death. And so I'm proposing that we should have a figure eight instead of a single cycle. And next slide. So reference man needs to be retired. Give him a gold watch. Thank you very much. We need to assume that everyone in the world is a reference little girl. We need to set our standards and our protection for x-rays, for um, radon levels for licenses of nuclear facilities, for discharges, all of it, assuming that the person getting it is a reference little girl. And that is only step one because it doesn't encompass pre-birth phases of our life cycle. Next slide. So why? I've told you this is in the data, but why? The data set we have doesn't answer this question. And it's so important, along with all the little sub-questions of why. And my teacher, Dr. Rosalie Bertel, 
suggested, put out a hypothesis that it has to do with the percentage of reproductive tissue in my body and your body as females compared to males, but that's an idea. We need to test it. No one has yet asked or answered these questions in a research setting. Next slide. And I wanna finish with this picture because to me, this is a picture of health. These women stopped a radioactive waste dump from coming to their ancestral lands. And so it's not only about avoiding radiation exposure, it's the empowerment, it's the joy of preserving life and health. Thank you so much, Mary, for sharing this really, really um, devastating uh, research in terms of its implications for all of us and the need to change our policy with respect to how regulations are set. I'm so grateful for your work and for all you're doing and continuing to, doing, to do to bring this forward to the world. It's so important. Thank you so much. We're going to move now to Marjan. Marjan, um, welcome again. I want to say you are dedicating every day of your life to nuclear, non nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. Why are you called to do this work? Hey, uh, hello. Thank you, Cynthia, for uh, first of all inviting uh, to speak today uh, and congratulations uh, on the inaugural session uh, of this um, project. I'm really glad uh, that it came uh, to, to be realized, yeah. So um, to start, uh, I think my passion for nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation comes from the Kazakhstan's nuclear legacy. Uh, and uh, for almost half of the century, from 1949 until 1989, um, Kazakhstan experienced nuclear testing on its territory uh, and it left detrimental consequences uh, on environment, on people. Uh, it also brought together uh, socioeconomical uh, problems, uh, as well as uh, mental and health issues uh, to the population of the semi test site, which is uh, located in the eastern part of Kazakhstan. And just to give an idea about the size of this test site, uh, it's equal to the country of uh, Israel, for example, or Belgium. Uh, and most importantly, what was um, uh, a reason for me to join a uh, nuclear disarmament field is, of course, the impact on people. Uh, on um, almost 1.5 million people uh, suffered and still suffer uh, from the high level of radiation resulting in the um, cancer, uh, in the premature deaths, uh, on, um, as Mary also mentioned uh, about the disproportionate harm uh, on women uh, and children, uh, as well as uh, the reproductive, reproductive functions of women. Uh, and um, this is all about my um, country fellows um, that are being uh, impacted by the story of nuclear testing. Uh, and it's not something that only exists um, in the um, documents, papers, uh, or in the documentaries, uh, or uh, in general in the policy papers. It actually exists in the lives of people, and the impact is being still uh, faced uh, up until now, and it will be still going on uh, since there is a transgenerational impact on health of people. Um, and um, primary inspiration for me as well was also the um, uh, anti-nuclear movement Nevada Simi Palatinsk, Nevada Simi, uh, which was the international uh, anti-nuclear movement um, that existed only for a short time of, uh, uh, of a period for three years from 1989 uh, till 1991. But nevertheless, it was very successful uh, in its aim uh, to shut down the Semite site in Kazakhstan. And how this happened? So the people from the Nevada test site, together with the people of Kazakhstan in Semite site, they came together regardless of the 
um, divided um, sides of the politics in the Cold War times, they came together united in solidarity and joint efforts uh, to stand together to fight uh, the nuclear testing. Uh, and uh, there is a documentary called Where the Wind Blew, which I would recommend uh, to everybody to watch and I can also write in the chat, uh, which tells the stories of uh, people uh, from Nevada side side uh, and uh, from Kazakhstan, from Simei. Uh, and it shares the personal stories of people uh, who are being affected by the nuclear testing legacy. And it's, um, it's really touching, it's very powerful, um, and it's quite short for the documentary, so I would definitely say that it's not boring to watch it. Uh, it's not available uh, on a public online, but um, if you're interested, I can help out with the access to this film. And uh, I was able also to help out with the film screenings so that more and more people would be um, uh, aware of this topic and to promote uh, the, um, the story of nuclear testing um, locally as well as globally. And especially engaging uh, young people as well as women, because as was mentioned before, we need more young people and women included into the decision-making process, into the policy-making process, as well as let them speak and make sure that their voices are heard and included. Uh, and um, also I would like to uh, mention that um, my country became um, nuclear free and it decided to, uh, to become nuclear free, although um, once the, um, um, the USSR dissolved and Kazakhstan had the potential of becoming the fourth nuclear biggest uh, arsenal in the world, it decided to go on the way of nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation, setting an example for other countries to follow. Uh, and um, Kazakhstan was quite active in promoting nuclear disarmament. So for example, um, it was uh, one of the major actors in establishing the Central Asian nuclear weapon free zone uh, to promote uh, the collective security it was also uh, initiator of the 29th of August, the International Day Against Nuclear Testing. Uh, and Kazakhstan is commemorating this day on an annual basis and every day there are events uh, that are promoting this day and making sure that more public is aware of the topic. So with this, uh, thank you, Cynthia. <laughs> Marjan, I, I just, um, that you're carrying this for your country and the people of your country is so inspiring. And I just want to say to everyone listening that this is not, nuclear testing is not a thing of the past anymore. Just a few months ago in May, the Trump administration announced that for the first time since 1992, they are considering resuming nuclear testing which would be devastating. There's so many people, as you mentioned, not only in Kazakhstan, but in New Mexico, in Nevada, in the Marshall Islands, in um, places, other places in the world where nuclear weapons have been tested that are still living with a legacy. So we can't let this happen again. And, you know, Kazakhstan somehow rose up against the repressive Soviet Union to change this and to, and to you know, stop nuclear testing and if they can do it we can do it if you guys can do it we can do it and also that you've created nuclear free zones you were the first country with nuclear weapons to give them all up so may that happen with the other nuclear armed states thank you so much for joining us and sharing thank you Cynthia. we're going to move now to jessica jessica you are a nuclear expert. You live and breathe nuclear policy. You're dedicating your life to this. Which nuclear threat are you most personally concerned about? What keeps you awake at night and what is Global Zero doing about it? Um, well, thank you, Cynthia, again. The world can be kind of frustrating and this work can be overwhelming. So it's really great to have a space to come together with everyone and hear their inspiring stories and feel support for this work. So thank you very much. Um, 
what keeps me awake at night um, is the concern um, and the threat of accidental nuclear war. You, you illustrated this so viscerally when you were speaking about the Hawaiian false alarm and others on the call I know were also, um, uh, also went through that. But there's this unacceptably high risk that nuclear weapons will be used by accident, by miscalculation, unintended escalation, or because of a false warning of an incoming attack. And we're in a period in the nuclear era where the belief that a country can fight and win a nuclear war has really come back into fashion. And, and nuclear planners think that they can control escalation and, and be able to use nuclear weapons to de-escalate a situation. Um, and current nuclear policies and postures around the world really feed into this belief. They encourage first use of nuclear weapons. They put pressure on leaders to use them in a conflict and underestimate the real risks of nuclear use that accompany these policies. So there are multiple nuclear flashpoints around the world in South Asia and Eastern Europe, South China Sea, Korean Peninsula, where small incidents and interactions involving nuclear armed states threaten to escalate to direct conflict, which can then spiral quickly to nuclear use. Now, the only way to eliminate that threat is to eliminate the weapons. That's the only way we're going to solve this issue. And um, as Cynthia mentioned, Global Zero has an action plan to do it. It's a step-by-step -step roadmap that really lays out um, a blueprint, a guide for the nuclear weapons states for the phased and verifiable elimination of nuclear weapons. And we work to put this plan into action through an international network of political and military leaders, national security experts, and through grassroots pressure, because it does take us all to get to zero. Um, we're working to raise awareness on the urgent threat and put forward policies to address those threats and engage directly with the nuclear armed governments to advocate for those policies and demand progress. Um, we recognize that we can actually get there in, in, in our lifetime. We can get to zero in 10 years, but we also recognize that there is still an urgent need for nuclear armed states to take steps in now to reduce the risk of nuclear use. And one step is for the U.S. and Russia to eliminate what's called launch on warning. So this launch on warning strategy is where each side says, we're going to launch our nuclear missiles on warning that you have launched your missiles at us. Um, and in order to do that, the US and Russia keep thousands of weapons ready to launch within minutes of receiving an order. Um, there's already been a number of false alarms um, and nuclear close calls, many having to do with computer error, some with human error, and luck is playing far too much of a role in preventing nuclear use. And we've been saved from potential all out nuclear war multiple times by one individual. Um, and we can't count on that forever. We can't count on luck. We can't count on one person saving us. We need to realize that global security cannot be built on weapons of mass destruction. And by eliminating launch on warning and taking all nuclear weapons off high alert, we take a big step toward mitigating the risks of nuclear use. Jessica, I, I, um, it, I, I love the way Global Zero combines the work to eliminate nuclear weapons with actually steps that are going to keep us here long enough to do it while we work on eliminating the nuclear weapons. Because at any moment, we could have not have that one individual that saves the world. Um, and so I just want to go now to, uh, to your, the work that you're doing on no first use. Why that's important, and if you could just talk a little bit about, give us a little bit more detail about the staged verifiable reduction plan that is really, as I said, the most comprehensive pathway, well thought through to get us there to, to zero nuclear weapons. Yeah, of course. So the path really starts with um, kind of a parallel track here, where the U.S. and Russia, because they have you know, 90% of the world's nuclear arsenal still, they really need to work together to come down and, and immediately extend this new START treaty, which is the last guardrail on both of their nuclear arsenals, and then immediately negotiate a follow-on treaty to get their numbers down even more. We say they can do it to 1100. 
um, and then do another round to 300 and then it will put everyone at kind of a, a, a same level. Everyone will have some sort of nuclear parity and then the world can then come down to zero. Um, but parallel to that, um, we've talked about there is a um, there is a role for all nuclear weapons states to play right now. It's not just the U.S. and Russia that have to tackle this. And in parallel to U.S. and Russia efforts, we will want the all the other nuclear weapon states, actually all nuclear weapon states, including the U.S. and Russia, to come together to talk about ways to reduce nuclear risk. And the campaign that we are spearheading right now is one for no first use. So no first use is a commitment to never use or threaten to use nuclear weapons first. It removes the pressure and incentive for nuclear armed leaders to go nuclear first in a crisis and would mark a fundamental shift in how these nuclear weapons are viewed in national security, reducing the role of nuclear weapons. And of course, decreasing the risk that they will actually be used. And so when everyone agrees nuclear weapons are not to be used first, we, we take away their reason for whatever perceived reason there is for their existence and we're set up to, to phase the weapons out and eliminate, and eliminate that nuclear threat for good. And I should say, so Global Zero is working with um, some of our high level um, validators in nuclear armed states on proposals for, for each nuclear armed country on how they can go about establishing or strengthening no first use commitments because China and India already have no first use commitments. So how can they strengthen them? Um, are there bilateral treaties, whether through trilateral treaties, multilateral treaties, or even just, you know, unilateral commitments to no first use? How is the best way to go and do that and then put pressure on those states? And then in the US specifically, we work really closely with a group called Beyond the Bomb. It's a grassroots organization that's really amazing. Um, they're building a mass movement to prevent nuclear war and end nuclear violence. And they're working to build support in Congress for no first use legislation. Um, so yeah, so it's we're, we're working on the inside game and the outside game, and that's really what's gonna build this pressure. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you so much, Jessica, for bringing Global Zero's work to us today, which you know really combines these two essential steps to get us to zero nuclear weapons and keep us around while we're doing it. So grateful for all your work. Thank you so much. We're going to move now to Natalia Jurina. Natalia, welcome again. You are also dedicating every day of your life to nuclear nonproliferation and disarmament. Why are you called to do this work? Um, I think that the fact that I was born in a nuclear weapon state make me, made me concerned about the issue. And the more I was studying about it, uh, about the nuclear weapons, the more terrified and concerned I became. I think that one of the biggest problems that we have now and the reason why the nuclear disarmament is in a deadlock now is the people's lack of understanding of the enormous threat uh, that nuclear weapons pose. Um, I'm sure that if, if um, there were more, pe more people aware of the danger, the situation would change. Um, anyway, I, I swear by the idea that uh, if you don't like something, change it. And uh, if you don't do anything about it, then don't say you, you're not okay with that. So all of us can do something about uh, disarmament. And um, the most important is to be passionate about what you're doing. And then everything is achievable. So I started to get um, educated about the issue and joined uh, several um, disarmament and non-proliferation movements, including youth groups. Uh, so that's how I started my career in this field. Um, for those who are just starting, I would like to say that no matter how small you consider what you are doing, uh, anyway, it is a small step towards achieving the ultimate goal. And in the end, it all counts. So several years ago, um, I met this girl from the United States. She was a student, but uh, she also worked as barista. And uh, she served coffee with nuclear latte art. 
So she literally was serving coffee with the images of nuclear explosions or missiles. And uh, that was how she was um, starting conversation with, uh, with her clients. And that's how she uh, was raising awareness about the nuclear threat. Uh, so um, who knows, maybe one day a representative of her government will, um, will, will visit her cafeteria, order a cup of coffee, and it will make him reconsider his nuclear policy. I mean, um, it is a chain reaction that you can't predict, but it works. And I believe that everyone can make a difference. Whatever you do to raise awareness about the nuclear threat is important. And uh, even one cup of coffee can change history. So it all counts. Natalia, that's beautiful. One, one step. Every, if everybody here on the call has one conversation about something that touched them today, and then those conversations just blossom, that's really every, every step. No act is insignificant. I love this barista story. So um, just briefly, you're a citizen of Russia. What concerns you most today about the nuclear risks between the United States and Russia? who together possess over 90% of the world's nuclear weapons, as Jessica mentioned. And what do you think is the one thing, just briefly, that we can do that we must take to reduce the risk? Yes. So today, according to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, we are closer to a nuclear catastrophe than we were during the Cold War. And as you said, both countries hold over 90% of the world's nuclear weapons and keep uh, almost uh, 2,000 2, nuclear weapons on high alert. And um, yeah, the, these leaves both countries too vulnerable to nuclear launch uh, by accident, miscalculation, uh, or even cyber attack. And the only uh, remaining bilateral arms control treaty is about to expire in several months. Uh, so the whole situation is very preoccupying. And since we don't see many efforts from our governments to at least reduce nuclear armaments, uh, we ordinary people need to take the lead and demonstrate that we stay against the nuclear war and nuclear weapons in general. Um, for instance, during the Cold War era, uh, people came up with some citizen diplomacy initiatives. Uh, aimed to improve the bilateral relations on people-to-people -people level. Uh, those were such initiatives as Peace Childs, Peace Bridges, uh, Space Bridges, which Cynthia was involved in. And uh, if you haven't heard about it, I highly recommend you to, uh, to Google about it because it is like very impressing, uh, impressive and very interesting. Um, also, the nuclear... Um, threat which seemed very uh, close and very real at that time inspired many other people. So a lot of songs were written, um, a lot of movies were produced, uh, Doctor Strange Love, for instance, or the movie The Day After about the consequences of the nuclear war, uh, which was actually so effective that it depressed President Re uh, Ronald Reagan and had a direct effect on his desire to end nuclear um, proliferation during his presidency. Uh, so it all counted. And I think that uh, through those initiatives, both governments got the understanding that people didn't want a war. And maybe this was one of the reasons why the war didn't happen. So uh, the history shows us that citizen diplomacy works. And since we, since the actual um, situation is more dangerous than it was during the Cold War, um, I think that we all must wake up and demand our governments to, to do something about it. Thank you, Natalia. And, and citizen diplomacy can play a role in restoring the dialogue, which has been cut off and makes the risk of a nuclear war much greater. So thank you so much for all you're doing. And for sharing your insight today. Keikashan, I want to move to you next. Um, you started your work with children on peace, justice, and sustainability when you were just eight years old and founded Green Hope Foundation at age 12. Why are you called to this work and what is your mission at Green Hope? Absolutely. I consider myself to be very fortunate to be born in a family where kindness, empathy, compassion, it's just a way of life. And growing up in this environment where I saw acts of kindness every day, I realized that it would 
not require an extra effort from a person to be caring. That should just be my natural self. Uh, so when I was five, my parents took me to Mother Teresa's Missionaries of Charity head offices in Kolkata, in India. And that was and still is the most impactful experience in my life. I prayed at her memorial. I spent time in the room where uh, she lived and interacted with the children who the missionaries cared for. And I had taken my toys and books to give them. And I recall the absolutely wonderful time that I had playing with them and just enjoying that camaraderie and joy. But it was also very difficult for me to understand why none of these children had parents like me. And I really wanted to do everything I could to help them. When I was nine, I visited Jordan with suitcases full of books and toys for the Iraqi war refugee children. So the spirit of giving and caring was something that just came naturally to me due to my upbringing and seeing what my parents and grandparents did. And a couple years before that, when I was seven, I saw the image of a dead bird with its belly full of plastic. And my young brain just went numb at the thought of the pain and agony the bird must have endured. And at that moment, I realized that human actions caused the pain and suffering all around that affected human beings, birds, plants, animals, as well as the natural environment. And it really wasn't something that I could ignore and just move on. I had to take action. And that's how I began my journey by planting my first tree on my eighth birthday, which is also coincidentally World Environment Day. And for the next uh, three years, I worked extensively within my local community, engaging schools, my neighbors, local commercial establishments to uh, just think about the planet and the society uh, did a lot of ground level work through tree plantings along with relief campaigns to support victims of natural disasters in different countries. And then my work got noticed and the UN somehow caught hold of what I was doing. I was invited to speak at my first UN conference when I was 11. And when I was 12, I attended Rio Plus 20 as the youngest international delegate. And the, out of the 50,000 delegates, I was, like I said, one of the youngest there and I really did not like this lack of inclusivity of children and young people because none of us had a say in this conference and I found that not only ironic but also grossly unjust and so I decided to change that and on my return from Brazil I founded Green Hope Foundation with a handful of my friends and my mission and Green Hope's mission was simple to bring about greater inclusivity of young people and children especially so that we could decide and influence decisions and actions that affected our future. And I learned immensely from Rio being deeply involved in the process that led to the adoption of the Future We Want document that was the basis of the current Sustainable Development Goals. And being involved from such a, an early age helped me to clearly understand also how all of these goals are related, that they're not silo based, one cannot be achieved without the other, and that any gaps that existed in one goal had negative repercussions on the other. And also that our world has finite resources with increasing strain caused rapidly by a, a growing population. And in these situations, I found it absolutely criminal that nations should be wasting billions and now trillions of dollars on weapons of mass destruction on nuclear warheads when people didn't have enough food to eat did not have access to health did no access to education the countries didn't have this for their citizens and this wastage of resources had to be the first step in ensuring reallocation of resources that will be better utilized to create a life of dignity for all, which is, as we all know, the objective of the SDGs. And there continues to be this lack of awareness about these issues. And nations not only hide their armed spending, but also try to legitimize in the guise of national pride and security, as some of my fellow mentors just mentioned. 
So at Green Hope, we work to cut through this charade by increasing awareness. And we do this using education for sustainable development as a transformative tool. Hey, Gishan, I, I love the way you connect all of the issues. It's so organic and it makes so much sense. And you start with children. You have a very creative approach mm -hmm. to engaging children, starting introducing them to certain issues when they're younger and then over time. Can you just talk just briefly about that approach, share that approach with us? Sure, absolutely. So the two main issues that Green Hope works to address are the lack of inclusivity and the low level of awareness amongst most young people, especially in developing nations where they form a majority, major part of the population. And as I mentioned, we use education for sustainable development because uh, we believe that really gives them the knowledge, skills, behaviors to think and act for a sustainable future and also to identify someone else's challenge as one's own. And we developed an advocacy tool called in, like Sustainability Academies, which are workshops, conferences organized by children for children. And I train our youth members, some of whom are as young as six, to conduct these academies and these unique peer-to-peer -peer engagement, which have proven extremely effective for the target audience. And they take it really enthusiastically. But many of the topics that are discussed from nuclear disarmament to health to biodiversity loss are kind of difficult uh, for them to comprehend. So, and many of the children that we work with don't go to school and some of them don't even know how to read and write. So to circumvent these issues, we use the innovative non-formal communication modes in our advocacy, uh, such as art, dance, music, drama, sports, fashion, writing to spread awareness. And our academies also incorporate STEM education with these to build that necessary skill set. And armed with this knowledge, our academy participants then venture out into their local communities to take actions and localize the SDGs. And we work with children and youth in developed uh, countries as well, in, since there's a, a complete lack of absence, I would say, of sustainability education in most places. So whether it's in a Rohingya refugee camp or in a public school in Manhattan, we've found that children have the same instinctive love and empathy for nature. And it is this passion that we are rekindling using education as the catalyst. And specifically for disarmament, we believe that it's not an adult topic and neither should it be restricted for discussion by just scientists or technical experts. So we are using disarmament education to create awareness amongst young people, especially girls and women who've always been left out of the dis dis discussion. And they're also the ones, as we all know, who get disproportionately affected by violence and war. So during the pandemic, we uh, organized an international sustainability debate on the theme of nuclear disarmament and peace for children and youth. And all of them were under the age of 18. And it was uh, truly inspiring to see what young people had to say about this issue. Teams from four countries were, and the whole global audience who took part in that. And as I also mentioned earlier, music is one of our mediums of engagement. So we composed a peace song that called for disarmament. And to celebrate International Day of Peace this year, we created a digital message board bringing together multi-generational voices from across the world answering the question, what does peace mean to me? So we continue to combine digital, creative, as well as on the ground advocacy to fulfill our mission, which is that of a peaceful and sustainable world for all. Beautiful, Kekesha. You bring so much together and you started so young and you're so inspiring. And thank you for all you're doing for children and all of us all over the world. It's such a gift. Um, I just want to say that all of these mentors are now on our website and they've offered to be available for post-mentorship collaboration with their organizations. Um, and so we're putting the link to the website with all of their contact information and the organizations that they're involved in and they're welcoming 
you to join them in this work. So we are inviting all of you. We need you. We need these women to keep doing their incredible work and we need you to join us and join them in, um, in working for the elimination of nuclear weapons. So we're putting that in the chat now and you'll all be getting it afterwards as well in an email. So just very briefly, I'd like you each to address our final question and we're gonna do this in the round. Um, and and I, we, ha we have very little time. So if you each could just say something from your heart, uh, which is on this day, the UN day for the total elimination of nuclear weapons, what is your hope, your prayer, your message for the women who are gathered here with us today? And I'll start with you, Mary. Love is the most powerful force in our universe. That, that is clear to me. However, hope is a resource and we all need to find it because without hope going along with the love, we're kind of stuck. So go so find some hope. Thank you, Mary, that's beautiful. Marjan, are you still with us? I think she had to go maybe to her another, another event. So then we'll go next to Jessica. I think the message is that we need to believe that we can eliminate nuclear weapons in our lifetime. We can do this. It is not impossible. And the only way we're going to be successful is to not just have everyone at the table, no matter your age, gender, um, race, socioeconomic um, background, but not just to be at the table, but to be actively involved and actively heard and actually breaking down that table and rebuilding a bigger table and one that is founded on a reimagining what security actually is, what real security is. Beautiful. Thank you, Jessica. Natalia. Um, you know, when I talk uh, about nuclear threat to people who don't work in this field, they usually seem to be like interested, but um, they don't consider it as something that um, it, it is an issue uh, which they can do something about. Uh, they think that uh, it is like only high level diplomats and politicians can um, can do something about nuclear disarmament. So I wish there were more people um, uh, that felt empowered and uh, more people believed that they can change the situation because the nuclear disarmament is everyone's issue. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Take a shot. I would say that my prayer is a call to action, I think, for uh, all of us, uh, and not a call to action, I'd say, that urges all of us to uh, no longer bear this injustice of wasting resources by build building weapons of mass destruction when innocent people are dying of hunger and disease. And I firmly believe that our silence and our inaction is equal to being complicit. So each and every one of us must hold ourselves accountable and take actions and the ways to do so are many. And only if we join forces will we be able to create a world where fear is replaced by joy, hatred by love and distrust by empathy. And when that happens, we will truly have a world free of this menace. Beautiful vision. Thank you to all of you mentors. So grateful. We're now going to move to our honored guest and we're so honored Ambassador White to have you with us today. We're so thrilled that you were able to join us and take time to be here with us. And I'm just gonna introduce you now, welcome. And I, Ambassador Elaine White Gomez is a member of the special team on strategic foresight for Costa Rican foreign policy at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Costa Rica. She previously served as the former ambassador from Costa Rica to the United Nations in Geneva. In 2017, Ambassador White presided over the proceedings of the United Nations Conference that negotiated and adopted the landmark treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. 
Facing extraordinary time pressure and at times contentious debate, Ambassador White facilitated the adoption of this landmark agreement by a vote of 122 nations in favor, one against, and one abstention. Among her many accomplishments, Ambassador White is also the first woman and the youngest person ever to serve as Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs in Costa Rica. Welcome, Ambassador White. So happy to have you with us. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you very much, Cynthia. I, I have enjoyed every single minute um, of everything I have heard this morning, and I want to thank you for, for inviting me. And something, uh, although, of course, uh, this is a busy day, something um, uh, gave me this message that I needed to make time to, to be here. And I, I don't regret it. I, I have enjoyed every single minute. So thank you a lot. I know how busy you are, so I know what a big deal this is. Thank you. Um, so I want to start with the questions for you. How did the historic treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons come to be? How important was women's leadership? And what was it like for you as a woman to lead the historic negotiations at the UN? Well, let me start by saying um, that, let me connect, let me uh, try to connect with this. Um, because I am, I am a diplomat, I always heard and read that between the global risks that humanity faces, um, a global a pandemic, pandemic, a global pandemic was a risk, a possibility. And, you know, all of us thought about it and have it in the back of our minds, but not really thought that was something that was going to touch our lives. Well, it happened. We are connected here, not, I mean, it's, it's a blessing that we are now able to, to connect through technology, but we completely stopped having meetings and uh, a, you know, official meetings at the UN and so on and so forth. We have lost so many lives by something that we knew was a possibility, a very, very important possibility, but we never prepared for it. For it. It is the same thing with nuclear weapons. And the possibility is much, much higher than that of a pandemic because of the, of the uh, amount of, of nuclear weapons and, and, and the amount that are uh, ready to be launched within minutes. Um, so we need to, to think. It is very sad to have to think about this, but this is a, a, a reality. We don't want this to become a, a, a reality overnight. And I am very glad to see um, some women connected. And I, am, I was touched by your um, explanation and your introduction and how a, the threat of a nuclear attack was a reality even if it was for 30 something minutes in your life. It was a reality. And this is exactly what citizens, survivors, and those countries who think and who believe in nuclear disarmament have been telling the world for 75 years. It is the human a impact. This is not something that this is something that's very interesting for uh, what's happened in international affairs um, after the, at the end of the Cold War, that we stop discussing different uh, societal problems like development or security, just as a, a, a problem of the state because the state is us, all human beings. So we stop discussing about development as the process of economic growth only. And now, we, and then we started in the 90s, we started to talk about human development. 
which is the process of entitlement of people's capabilities. So the, the human being came to being at the center. It was only about time. It was, it was only about time when this human approach was going to uh, impact a human, a nuclear diplomacy. And to put the human being at the center. This is not about state security. It is about human security. What exactly it is going to mean if we have another detonation. What it is going to mean for the people, for the environment, for economic production, for the survival of humankind. And that is the discussion that the treaty brought about. And you know that this was a reality because of citizens. As uh, Natalia was talking about ordinary citizens, there is no such a thing as ordinary citizens. There are citizens. We are all the same. Sometimes we play roles in representation of other citizens. It doesn't make us extraordinary. We are ordinary citizens playing extraordinary roles, right? So um, it was the strength, conviction, and, uh, and the technological progress in telecommunications and in the, the possibility of moving around the world that gave uh, renovated strength to the fight to eliminate nuclear weapons. Because let us remember that the, the call and the conviction to um, abolish and prohibit, to abolish nuclear weapons and prohibit them in international law started almost the very same day that the, the, the bombs were dropped on Nagasaki and on, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the first call came from the international doctors that first arrived in, uh, uh, to Hiroshima, representing the International Red Cross. It was a Swiss doctor that was there and saw, he saw the destruction. And he said, whatever was it that was dropped here, it has to be abolished and it has to be prohibited. And in the next year, um, the international movement of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent movement already launched the call for abolition and prohibition of nuclear weapons. And actually this call was taken on board by the United Nations because the very first thing that the UN did, the first session of the General Assembly, First year, first session, resolution number one, one agreement, first one, was to create a, 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 a committee to deal with the abolition of nuclear weapons from national arsenals and to making sure that the nuclear energy was only going to be used for peaceful purposes. So what happened between 1946, resolution one, and 2017, in which we actually abolished, I mean, we actually prohibited, legally prohibited nuclear weapons. Well, first, in the 70s, we had uh, the United States and the then Soviet Union uh, proposing to the rest of the world the, the, the non-proliferation treaty. And uh, this treaty has been so successful that most countries of the world have forsaken nuclear weapons as a means of, of security. We not only have uh, eliminated, completely eliminated the, 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 the possibility of seeking our security through nuclear weapons, we have legally committed to staying non-nuclear in our, in, at the global level, but also at the regional level, because there are uh, several regional uh, free, uh, nuclear free, uh, free, uh, free zones in Latin America, the Caribbean, in Africa, in Central Europe, um, in Asia, in the Pacific. So we had the, the non-proliferation treaty. We had regional treaties that completely prohibit uh, and declared a nuclear uh, uh, weapon-free zones. 
And also we had, after the end of the Cold War, we had the first uh, significant reduction of, of nuclear arsenals uh, by the US and Russia. But then the pace of the, of the elimination and the reduction um, either completely stopped or was um, reduced. And that reduction and that trend was also uh, taken with, with a lot of concern by the rest of the world because we started to see the opposite uh, trend of um, what we call uh, vertical proliferation. That means um, increasing that the nuclear powers were increasing their investments in the production of um, and uh, modernization of their nuclear arsenals um, to a degree that for, uh, for some of us, we are already seeing a new arms race in the nuclear, in the nuclear field. So this is what triggered empowered citizens all around the world to come together and form with governments and scientists um, this new movement of the of the uh, the so-called the humanitarian uh, impact of nuclear weapons movement, which was the one that very successfully brought to center stage again at the UN the issue of the legal prohibition of nuclear weapons. And this is all, and this is uh, an, a, a sphere in which we have to, to think about Eva Kusha, they are women, the survivors, they are women and have devoted their lives to speaking to the world about their suffering, but it, what it really entails to be a victim of a nuclear detonation. Um, we have to think about the civil society leaders, the scientists, I want to, to commend um, Mary Olson and, and her magnificent work that actually, of course, was taken on board by the treaty as we acknowledge the, the disproportionate effect of, of um, radiation on, on women and girls, precisely. So thank you very much for that work that you have undertaken and you have devoted your life to this. Um, think about, and then the representative of governments that were women like myself, that I had to be the government uh, part of, of it. And between 20, 2015 and 2017, there were three global, major global agreements, great successes in diplomatic history. The Paris Agreement, agreement that, led, that addressed the issue of climate change, the, 2030 develop, the adoption of the 2030 Development Agenda, and the adoption of the treaty of, that prohibits nuclear weapons. Of the three negotiation processes, two, uh, in two, women pay, uh, played a pivotal role. Climate change, actually my countrywoman, Cristiana Figueres, for being secretary of the UNFCCC, the United Nations uh, Convention um, on Climate Change, uh, she was the secretary of uh, in, 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 in the leading force in that agreement. And in the case of the abolition of nuclear weapons, we saw a conference in which the president was a woman, the leader of the civil society were women, um, the leader of the Iba Kusha was a woman, and there were also many, the, the United Nations representative, um, the um, high representative on disarmament for affairs was a woman. There were women scientists and women also engaged in negotiating the very technical, the most technical parts of the, of the agreement. So this is the role that we have been playing in this, in this process. Thank you for explaining all of that and sharing how women have really come forward to create this change in the world as a model at this time when it's so necessary. Um, I want to move to the next question and just say, what is the status of the treaty? Many of the women on the call don't know, you know, what that, that it's, it prohibits nuclear. What is the status right now? And um, I know it's very close to coming into force. 
what do you think that's going to mean when it comes into force? And what impact do you think that's going to have on the nuclear armed states who have not, none of whom have either signed or ratified the treaty? What do you think, what kind of difference do you think it's going to make? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, Actually, I think it was adopted by 122 of them, but the big majority of the international community. But I have to say that that is not something new because the, most of the world live in states that have already uh, prohibited nuclear weapons. Um, but I have to say that actually, for some, the global pandemic was going to be perhaps say a challenge in this in, in 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 taking the attention of leaders to sign the treaty but you know what has happened completely the opposite uh, we have gained momentum and now we have 45 signatures um, I'm sorry 45 ratifications out of the 50 that we need so we are only we we already started the countdown uh, we only need five uh, more ratifications for entry into force. Um, and what this is going to mean, and, and everybody should be aware that this is the, the first time in history that a major, major legal instrument like, like this is adopted uh, with the strong opposition of um, the, let's say, the power of most powerful nations. And that is a sign of the times that we are living, of how uh, citizens and countries, and humanity, I mean, we are healthier and their, healthy their neighbor, more educated than ever, more connected than ever. The only thing that you can expect is that this is going to empower people to act at the global level to solve things that are important for humanity. So what this, this is going to mean, once it enters into force, this is when the real work starts for two reasons. It enters into force, and then so we have to start towards, to, to work towards universalization. That means to have, we're going to have the first 50, we need to have a, at least 122 that voted for it. And this is very important because this is where our strength is going to be needed. Because we have to be careful um, when we hear criticism about this effort. You have, to, you have to understand that this effort was led by responsible citizens of the world and by responsible governments. We have nothing to do with nuclear weapons. We have forsaken nuclear weapons for decades already. And it took even the non-proliferation treaty that was proposed by the big guys back then, it took 20 years to have even the, the five uh, permanent um, uh, members of the Security Council on board the treaty. So it takes time, but let me tell you this, because this is history. History um, is made by every single state that we take every day. Let us think about uh, scourges like um, slavery, colonialism, um, even apartheid. What has happened? A norm or a legal instrument or prohibition of, of that act, human activity usually takes place at the peak of that activity. And it takes time, uh, and this is the reason why I want, to, I want to emphasize that when the treaty enters into force, this is when we have to start working in universalization because then we have to start working in developing the normative strength of the treaty. What does it mean? It means that it is true, we already know, know that norms do have an impact in the way that we humans behave and that states behave. Because as um, homo sapiens that we are, we have the ability to share 
um, abstract concepts and being led and in, in being um, and being able to share a, and come together through these a, abstract concepts like the concept of God or the concept of good. And imagine how many treaties and how many decisions and policies needed to be undertaken for slavery to finish. It took centuries. I believe it is not going to take centuries uh, to have a nuclear weapon free, uh, free world, um, but it takes time, especially when you are dealing with the issue you are dealing with is strictly connected to the power structure of the, of the, of the world at the moment. Such was slavery at the moment. It was connected to the power and economic power structure and um, security structure of the world. So we need to start working and uh, in the normative strength of the treaty. And it is going to be for the first time that in international law, this is, this is something that really, it's really outstanding. Um, countries not only reject, we consider them illegal and not legitimate, not legitimate instruments of security for the 21st century. And that the, any use of such weapons will be abhorrent to the principles of humanity and the dictates of, of um, human conscience. This is going to be a very strong uh, way in which we turn around the official discourse from nuclear weapons are necessary to nuclear weapons are illegal and unacceptable. And that is going to have an impact in, in policy making. So inspiring, Ambassador. I wanna just go to the last question with you and then we're gonna to move to the Q&A. Um, and just briefly, on this day marking the UN Day for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons, what is your prayer, your message for the women who have gathered here with us today? What is your hope? Um, Everything we do in life is an exercise of hope. Everything we do in life is an exercise of hope. So every single person needs to be aware. We need, a, of course, citizen uh, diplomacy, but we need women and citizens around the world to talk to their leaders, to send an email, to talk to their uh, neighbors, to their friends. We need to be aware this is real, this is a real risk. So my hope is that we are going to start by the action of very committed citizens that are aware of what exactly this means for humanity, that we are going to start a continuing, continuing, that is going to lead us to the elimination of weapons of mass destruction as a way of security for the 21st century and beyond. May it be so. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Yeah. May I say, may I say something that's very, it's 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 very important for all of us in the way we approach and we deal with. Words are important, very important. Words are very important and very energetic. Um, and I have found that whenever I talk to citizens from nuclear weapon states. The concept that we have in our minds is non-proliferation. Non-proliferation means it's so successful that most of the nations in the world have already committed to that. We don't have nuclear weapons. We don't aspire to have them. We don't believe in them. But non-proliferation means you stop the others from having them, but we still own them. And this is what we have to change non-proliferation, we have to move to nuclear disarmament, to abolition, and to prohibition. You explain it so well and so clearly. 
Thank you for that. Really, really important. I want to move now to the Q&A. Um, we're going to start work first for questions for Ambassador White. And we invite those of you with questions for the ambassador to come forward now. If you have a question, please click on the icon participants at the bottom of your screen. At the bottom of the window on the right hand side of the screen, you'll then click the button labeled raise hand. And if you are called on, please unmute yourself to answer. Please try to keep your questions brief so that more people can participate. And I also want to say that we're going to end the session um, when it's supposed to close at, at uh, it's in my time, it's going to be 10 a.m. And I'll just briefly interrupt the Q&A to end the session. Some of the met registrants have asked if the Q&A and, and the discussion continue after the session ends and a number of mentors will be available along with me past uh, the time of closing for about a half an hour for people who want to stay to ask more questions. But we're going to start now with questions for the for Ambassador White. So please bring your questions forward. Another question? Okay. Well, I have one more question, <laughs> which is, um, Let's see, does anyone have a question for the ambassador? Okay, let's see. Uh, Mary. Hi, um, I just wanted to know if you've always had the sort of intrinsic hope that you do or if there's been times where you felt sort of hopeless and scared because I, I feel quite hopeless and scared but everyone here seems so hopeful and I'm wondering if that's always been the case. How do you hold on to it, I guess? Okay, thank you. Thank you for that question because I am a human being. I'm not extraordinary. I share the same concerns. And many times you are, you feel down and you feel uh, concerned and even, you can even be a thought, depressed when you see many things happening in the world. And this is when you see that you know, when people were fighting against slavery, they continue to, to, to fight. There is no other way than continue your road because whatever you do today is going to build up with other, with other, other steps. And at some point, sometimes um, people who start the struggle do not see uh, the end of it. This is why it is so important that we still were able to uh, adopt the, the uh, prohibition of nuclear weapons when still there are many Ibakusha, I mean, many survivors are alive, but not many. But I have to tell you, to share with you my concern is that we have been living for decades and centuries with one in, in, the, in the international community with one, um, let's say, one instrument that has created all the decades that we have uh, uh, enjoyed of, of human progress, which is uh, legal commitments. Legal commitments between states are what we have been using for decades and centuries to bring about um, you know, peaceful coexistence, human progress, etc. My concern now is to see how some leaders at the world stage are completely walking away from that very basic instrument of international relations, which is legal commitments. If you destroy the law, international law, international um, legal commitments, it is the only way that we have opposite opposite to war and the use of force. And this is something that we only can hope that citizens around the world can, you know, raise their voices on this issue. We need, we need, we need to, um, to make sure that it is respect and to, uh, to actually increase the 
the culture of compliance with legal standards and norms. But I share, I share concerns with you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Mary, for that question. A really important question for us. I'm calling now on Anne Wright. Tom, can you give me a little help here? Yeah. Uh, Anne, are you there? Anne, if you could unmute yourself. Can you help Anne, Tom? She's unmuted. Oh, she was muted again. And if you unmute yourself. It's unmuted. Okay. And we welcome you to ask a question. So glad to see you here. We'll come back to Anne. Do you want to un unmute Cheryl, um, Tom? I'll just ask Cheryl to unmute, please. I'm sort of show my video. Okay, uh, <clears throat> this has been um, an excellent webinar. I've been to so many in the last six months, being sheltering in place. And uh, I would like to ask the ambassador, I am aware that Costa Rica is one of the few countries in the world that does not have a standing army. And I'd like to understand how much um, Support did she receive from her own government as she worked on the treaty negotiations back in 2017? Was it important uh, to your work with the UN that you had the support of your own government? How much um, extra, imp you know, extra impact were you able to have because of that? Or, or were you on all by yourself? Thank you. I think that is a completely strategic um, question because I, I don't see myself um, having done that work if I were not from Costa Rica. Because I knew that I had absolutely complete support from my government and from my society. And it is fundamental because of uh, the issue that we're dealing with and the political pressures that might, uh, that might come uh, in the way. And uh, all the consultations that we undertook before I, before I officially took the, the role, all of them were go for it. And I felt, felt completely, absolutely supported by my government throughout the negotiations. That gave me strength, complete strength. I had no doubt whatsoever, not the minimum, that I was not completely embraced and supported by my government and my country. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, thank you very much because I think that is a fundamental question. My, the strength of my, of my government was, was uh, fundamental. So important, Ambassador, thank you. I have, we have a question from Anne Wright, which has gone into the chat, which is for you, which is, were all the nuclear states as difficult as the US for the treaty negotiations? <laughs> I know you're a diplomat, so. <laughs> um, no, let's say that, um, I, uh, you know, we had talks with all, with all countries, of the world, all of it, even the nuclear states. I, I had conversations with everybody and um, most, most of them were, um, were easier to put it that way, were easier. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador. Um, Estelle Marsh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question, We're calling on you? <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for everything so far. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, I feel that as a youth personally, uh, beyond reading about things, 
I haven't taken any direct action towards um, like contributing to nuclear disarmament. And I was wondering if you had any advice or tips or action points that young people could take to have the most impact in um, trying to help towards nuclear disarmament. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interest and, and your conviction. Talk to your friends. Start doing that. Talk to your friends so that uh, you start convening to them uh, the importance of this issue for your generation, for all humanity, but for your generation, and try to, to talk to them and in terms of even in, 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 in very practical terms. Um, let's say, for instance, every single minute, a hundred and doubt. $140,000 are spent on nuclear weapons. Let's say $200, uh, $200 million every single day. $200 million, can imagine what we can do with $200 million. Well, every day, $200 million are spent on nuclear weapons. And this is absolutely important. And something that I, that I uh, would suggest to all women, you don't have to become experts. We have heard wonderful experts here today, but you just have to be uh, citizens that are aware and that manage just basic figures. Um, how many, how many, 15, 13,000 warheads, how many of them are instead of alert? More than we need. Around 3,000 of them might be instead of alert. That means in 10 minutes, even less than what uh, Cynthia was telling us at the beginning, could be detonated. So talk to your friends. And if you want to go ahead and you can write an email to your representative and go for it. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador White. I want to bring the session to a close and then we'll continue the Q&A for those who can stay beyond us. Um, I want to thank, give you a really special thanks again, Ambassador, for joining us on a day that I know is really busy in your life at the UN because it is the day for the total elimination of nuclear weapons. It was such a gift for you to be here with us sharing your wisdom and you so your stories. And um, I so just deep bows of gratitude to you for all that you have done for this and for all you're going to do and all you're doing. So thank you so much for being here. I also now want to thank all of the mentors for coming um, and sharing your incredible work and wisdom with us. Tom Dawson, who's been doing a great job um, with the tech management of the Zoom session and Colleen Moore, the amazing Colleen Moore from Global Zero and Beyond the Bomb for all your incredible live sharing on social media, posting through the event, sharing this with the world. Thank you so much. And finally, I'm going to thank all of you amazing, wonderful women from all over the world for being here with us, for having the courage to show up, to claim your seat at the table and take this on. Let's just decide right here and now on the day that the UN has marked for the total elimination of nuclear weapons that we're going to make this happen. We're going to get this done. We're going to eliminate nuclear weapons. We need all of you. We'll be sending you an email following this again with collaboration opportunities with all the mentors. And our next session is going to be on October 24th. The topic will be why nuclear weapons matter and how to spread the word. And we'll be hearing from incredible women like Colleen and Molly Hurley, who's with us from Beyond the Bomb, on why nuclear weapons are connected to so many other issues we care about, climate justice, the pandemic, systemic racism, and violence against women. And we're going to be hearing from women on the front lines who are masters at sharing and organizing and teaching. So again, thank you all for coming. And for those of us who need to, those of you who need to leave, we're closing the circle of the session with a blessing to all of you and so much gratitude. And for those who wish to stay for another half hour, we will continue the Q&A with the mentors who are able to stay with us. Not everyone can right now. Thank you. Blessings. So grateful. Blessings. Thank you very much.
Okay, so let's start with which mentors are still here with me so that we people know who they can direct questions to. I know Mary had to go. Jessica, are you still here? Yes. Great. Sure. Jessica and Keikasha, are you still here? I'm here. Okay, and, and Natalia? Yes, I'm here. Okay, and I know Marjan and Mary had to go and obviously the ambassadors. So please, we have another half hour for those of you who wish to stay longer to engage in a conversation. This can be more of a, an informal dialogue if you wish, but we wanted to make ourselves available to you. So please direct your, anyone who has a question. Let's see. Kayla, um, I'm calling on you to lower your hand. It's so good to see you here. I'm so happy that you're with us. Um, okay, one second here. There we go. Um, okay, um, it's so, so, so wonderful to be here. I'm, because of our generation, I was part of the Big Peace March in the 1980s. And so it's been a life work and I mean, we thought we ended something somewhere and it's so bizarre to realize that we had 64 times overkill in the 1980s. That means we could destroy the planet 64 times over. And now to realize it's worse when we have no threat, it's like we don't even know who the enemy is, you know? And it's so bizarre, the psyche of it. And the US we know is the, the worst of it. and. So how to change the psyche, you know, the deep, deep psyche in America is in this incredible throes, the cauldron of our, what do we do with violence and how do we really deal with life as the choice instead of destruction. So I bow to all of you. I deeply, I'm so grateful for your, for all of your work. And I wanted to address uh, my question or my thought or my whatever it is to Kate, 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 I'm not saying it right. Kate, 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 I was so inspired because the youth, it's the future. And so I'm just, if you could, um, you know, this, this balance between the sustainability goals and peace and life. So I would love to hear from you a little bit more about some of your work and your projects on the forefront, because it's, I mean, it's, it's reality. You are the future. And I was, I'm so inspired by all of you that I would love to hear more of you, more of it because it's like spirit itself. The reality is being born through the children and it's amazing to, um, to experience it. So I would love to hear more from you about some of your forefront projects. Of course, yeah, thank you. Uh, basically, as I mentioned, I began my journey in the international arena in uh, Rio in 2012, and then I was involved in all of the other negotiations and uh, the, or everything that took place before the sustainable development goals were adopted. And I was one of the 193 youth who represented each mem UN member state when the SDGs were adopted at the GA. So that has always been very close to my heart and I'm a firm believer in ground level, grassroots level action to ensure a sustainable world. So we were, as Cynthia mentioned earlier, we work in 16 countries and that also means that every single country and every single community has different and unique challenges. So. Uh, on one hand, in some parts of the world, we focus on few SDGs and the other parts of the world, other ones. Um, our projects, we've planted over 110,000 trees worldwide. We've planted over 5,000 mangroves. We work extensively on turtle conservation, both uh, sea and river turtle conservation. We've done over 165 beach, ravine, uh, community cleanups. Uh, that is with the environmental side. On the social side, we, and on the gender uh, side, we provide, especially during the pandemic, providing women and girls with on workshops on how to protect themselves from sexual assault. Also, uh, during this pandemic, we have been distributing uh, sanitation kits. So uh, that includes masks, gloves, uh, sanitizers, sanitary pads, 
uh, all of these for the women and girls in the marginalized communities in Bangladesh. We've also been uh, continuing our tree planting efforts as well and, uh, talk, and promoting education for sustainable development in different parts of the world. Uh, we work on giving solar lamps, uh, in, especially in marginalized communities, one of which is the run of Kutch, which are the salt pans of India, where you have people living in terrible conditions with no electricity, children don't go to school, and even if they do, they don't have any way to study at night, so they drop out and their life expectancy is like less than 40. So the solar lamps that we gave them, this was back just after the SDGs were adopted in 2015, uh, would actually gave the children an avenue to study at night and therefore continue their education. And we also, I also mentioned that we've planted more than 5,000 mangroves all around the world. One of our main projects has been in uh, mangrove rehabilitation in the Sundarbans, which is the world's largest mangrove forest spanning India and Bangladesh. And over there as well, we, when we distributed solar lamps to the children in the villages, that actually would protect uh, the villagers from tiger attacks at night so that they would actually be able to apprehend the danger. Uh, and this is working with civil society. We also work uh, with the private sector to ensure that they are not left out of the dialogue because their sustainability initiatives definitely help out. So educating, once again, coming back to education, educating their employees on sustainable tourism. This is with hotels or sustainable architecture and engineering, and this is with the construction industry. Uh, so basically through all of our campaigns, we work to tackle inequality and promote inclusivity. And through that, we have provided education for sustainable development to children in Kutupalong, the world's largest refugee camp, which is the Rohingya refugee camp on the Bangladesh Myanmar border, the Syrian refugee camps engaged with uh, homes for children of prisoners, ch children with HIV AIDS, uh, also children in orphanages, children on the streets, making sure that they're not left behind and that we truly work to achieve a life of dignity for all. So in short, that is what we do. And that is our way of trying to achieve a peaceful and sustainable world. Thank you so much. It's awesome to hear. It gives us hope for the world, for the future. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Shai, you bring hope to everyone. Every session I've been in, you know, at this time, you know, Mary Carol was talking about the despair and you bring so much hope um, for the future. So I echo what, what Kayla just said. Uh, thank, thank you, Kayla, for that beautiful question. I am of your generation and was back then doing the marches too. So I know what it feels like. So thank you so much for bringing that forward in this session and for doing and caring for all these years with all the changes. Thank you so much. Any other questions at this point? We've got, um, again, Natalia, Jessica, Kekesha still with us. Would anyone else like to ask a question or does anyone have something they'd like to share? And I can hold, yes. I'm sorry, I, I thought that I just might uh, add some information about the um, post collaboration, if if I can, I don't know, <laughs> Cynthia, what do you think? Sure, sure. Yeah. I see one question in the chat. There's one question that's appeared in the chat. So please, please say, please share, and then we'll go to, um, yeah. yes. Okay, so I just would love the participants of this program to become um, a community of professionals dedicated to end the proliferation of nuclear weapons and to achieving nuclear disarmament. So some of you are part of some organizations, movements, uh, so please share opportunities among each other, invite each other to, to the events that you are organizing. So, but from my part, I, I would like to mention that um, 
I, I work for the agency um, for the prohibition of nuclear weapons in Latin America and the Caribbean, OPENAL, and we have some internship program. Um, and I don't know if there are any participants uh, from the Caribbean, but um, I highly recommend uh, those people from Caribbean to apply because uh, in this case, um, it is a paid in internship. So, um, and if you have any questions and um, you want to know more about this internship program, I, I believe that Cynthia will send uh, my contacts to you. Uh, and also, I would like to mention the incredible opportunity uh, of uh, the CTBTO youth group. Um, so uh, the CDBTO is the um, Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization uh, youth group, and um, yeah, uh, the 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 treaty the treaty is not in force, and that's why the uh, the uh, organization uh, launched this initiative for young people who want to push the treaty towards uh, its entry into force. And in my case, the CDBTO youth group opened for me this um, door to to the nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation world. Uh, and thanks to the CTBTO youth group, I am where I am now. So um, I think that um, if, if you want to start your career in this field, uh, the CTBTO youth group is the best way, uh, is one of the best ways you can do it. And I encourage all of you to apply. So uh, also if anybody has any questions uh, about the CTBTO youth group, what uh, we do there, who are these people who are members of the CTBTO youth group, you can reach out to me anytime and I would be more than happy to, to help you with that. Thank you. And, and Natalia, I just want to explain that, that the CTBTO is, is, is the treaty to ban all nuclear testing for all time. And that's what, that's what, that is, that's what you all there are working on. We have a question, a request from Selassie Flower. Do you still have a question? I see that you put your note in the chat. Um, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, I, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can. We can. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is, I want to know how I can become more involved. I know that there was some really good information just prior to me asking this question. But I guess for me, um, specifically, uh, now that everyone's kind of online, how can we still make just as much of an impact when we're kind of online and we're maybe not able to kind of go to um, community spaces and like plant trees together without like wearing a mask and stuff? Like, I don't know, like how we can still make an impact even online. Because I know sometimes with a whole lot of other stuff going on, on the internet people sometimes don't care which is unfortunate so I guess like how can like I can get more involved and um, as well as trying to you know learn more information about you know these topics about you know banning nuclear weapons and how you know make sure that like the world doesn't just go up in flames you know because you know different countries are you know, at war with each other and like how, like I can make a big impact on, you know, that front as well, being that I'm a college student and I go to school online now. So yeah, I guess that, that was my question. Um, Jessica, do you want to start and then Keikasha, maybe you follow and this, this will actually take care of questions that we didn't have a chance to answer during the session because there was so much to share. So if you could start, maybe Jessica, and then Keikasha, if you could follow, I'd really appreciate it because you both have incredible opportunities that are going to be posted on our website to connect with you all. Um, so, but Jessica, please start. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure if you're you're located in the U.S., but um, in the U.S., Beyond the Bomb, which I mentioned, is doing a lot of great organizing work, even online. Um, there's still a lot of work that you can do. There's um, meetings with your members of Congress and representatives. There's reaching out online to other um, people in your community. There are um, things you can write and publish that connect. Thank you, Colleen. Colleen put the Beyond the Bomb link in the chat. Um, but there's things you can write that connect all of these issues um, 
um, and really bring about intersectionality in all of this work around organizing around race, racial justice, social justice, um, climate change, all of these things are so interconnected as people have been talking about. So there's a lot of things that you can do that can really make a difference, especially um, specifically on no first use. Um, the link that um, I think Tom shared um, has a sign up page for Beyond the Bomb that you can join the movement to um, um, to pass legislation on no first use in that in the US. Um, and if you're not in the US, um, you can connect with me and I'd love to connect with you and we can um, um, through Global Zero, which does more global work around no first use, um, we can definitely plug you in um, to some work um, on, on no first use and elimination. And, um, and especially if you are interested in um, some like policy and strategy stuff, but you also don't have to be interested in that, we, we, we welcome everybody. It, it, it's really it's really wonderful. There's so many opportunities and the people here are, are doing such great work, every one of them. And next month, as I mentioned, we're actually gonna have some of the activists who are on the front lines um, with us talking about how they do the work and how to talk about this and why they matter and why it's connected to everything else and how to make it matter to people whose attention is on all of the other stuff. And there's so much of it right now. But if we don't get this one right, and we're not here anymore to deal with the other ones, then you know we've missed something. And so we need to stop putting our attention on everything else except the end of life as we know it. And so I, we need to keep our attention everywhere, but we can't forget about this one. This is what a friend of mine who may still be on the call calls the forgotten fear. And um, it's not about fear, it's acting through love. But anyway, I, I uh, really encourage you to follow up, especially on some of these campaigns that are really important, like no first use and um, de-alerting and things that Jessica mentioned, uh, Beyond the Bomb and Global Zero are doing aw awesome work. So, um, Keikasha, yeah. please address. How can Absolutely. people engage with you? Yeah, uh, I think that as someone, as I mentioned, who works so extensively on the ground, and you can see in my background that we are very, very grassroots level, for us, we did have a very quick switch to the online world as soon as the pandemic hit. And we realized that while definitely we, th there were some avenues that were closed off because of this online world, there were a lot more avenues that opened up that allowed us to communicate with people uh, whom we might not have been able to communicate with, and especially for young people to interact with uh, policymakers, uh, people who are at the decision-making table and actually have concrete discussions on how to make this world a better place to live in. So using Green Hope's example, we've, I think, conducted over 30 high-level webinars just in the last few months, bringing experts to uh, our webinars and, uh, and letting them interact with the children and young people who work all around the world. And one of the main themes that we have been discussing is peace, culture of peace, and nuclear disarmament. I also mentioned earlier that we had our debate that allowed young people to be engaged in this uh, process. And all of our judges who are like really, really uh, people who've done so much work in this arena were so impressed by the fact that young people had so much to say about this issue. So I definitely think that there's a lot that can be done. We have continued our uh, art, music, uh, advocacy through the online world. We even uh, like mixed and edited our song uh, communicating with one another through Zoom in di across different time zones. So, and I think as young people, we have a lot of more opportunities to find new ways of uh, creating uh, positive change, even if it's just through the online world. And specifically for disarmament, uh, as I mentioned, we use disarmament education to spread awareness, and especially we are now making digital toolkits. We've already uh, published a lot of them, imparting uh, the knowledge to uh, children who have, and young people as well, who have no idea about nuclear disarmament, uh, no access to education in many uh, parts of the world, and talking to them about uh, these 
issues of the history of nuclear weapons, the devastation it's caused, uh, arsenals, uh, the process of mining, production, storage, waste siting, and how that affects local communities and natural ecosystems. So yeah, that's uh, what we're currently doing. Uh, and I just wanted to reiterate that, you know, we uh, have, there's a lot of opportunity for us to make, bring about change. And I see that there's a question about what's the average age of the young people. I don't actually want to know what the average age would be because we interact with the children who are uh, as young as five and six through our sustainability academies. And at the same time, we also interact with uh, uh, students who are in university or completing their PhD programs, for example. And not just with children and youth, but also with other members of society and spreading the awareness about the importance of disarmament, the importance of sustainable development. So really we engage with everyone. But yeah, there's a lot of opportunity to engage with. And I think if there's a will, there's a way. So there's definitely a lot that you can do. Cynthia, you're muted. Hey, Kisha, thank you so much again for, for showing us so many different ways that people can get involved and make a difference. And again, um, there is on the web website and it's been put in the chat uh, contact information for all of the mentors to engage with post session they're all available to answer your questions and and make recommendations to you based on what your interests are and so i just want to reiterate that that's a, there are really and that's what we need right now we we need just as we need these mentors we need all of you so um any other questions for the uh, mentors? Or do any of the mentors have questions for one another? This would be an opportunity for mentors to talk to each other if we didn't have that opportunity in the session. Am I missing any hands? It looks like Sarah. Sarah. Okay, Sarah. Sarah, please unmute yourself. We'd love to hear from you. Okay. Hi. Hi, Sarah. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Um, I just wanted to know, once these nuclear weapons are disarmed, what happens to the material? Does it ever, will it ever go away or will it just be there forever? That's a really, the, all the questions are great and that's a really important question. And Jessica, I'm going to uh, address that question to you because you're such, you're the nuclear expert here. Um, I'm unfortunately not a nuclear waste expert, but <laughs> um, in terms of, um, of nuclear weapons, um, there are some cases where some of the material, the fissile material in nuclear weapons can be used um, to power like nuclear reactors, which I know some people are, aren't fond of nuclear power either. Um, but there have been um, programs, there's one megatons to megawatts, which took um, nuclear fuel and like um, basically like brought it down to a place where it wasn't a um, weapons facile material anymore and it was able to be used um, um, for energy. Um, where we get into some trouble is on the um, plutonium side. Um, and there are people who are working on ways to, to deal with this waste in a way that won't harm the environment. Um, this is probably one of the toughest questions that we have when people talk about nuclear disarmament and elimination because at the moment, we don't have a very good answer, to be honest. Um, these nuclear waste is, is a problem that is just pervasive in a lot of communities and has caused a lot of damage. And, and if you look at Hanford nuclear waste site, there's, there's a lot of leaking going on and it's, it's, it's not a good situation. And unfortunately, we haven't come up with a way to deal with all of the nuclear waste at this point. Um, there is 
a in the global zero action plan there is a um a plan to have kind of an international body to deal with fissile material um and that part of it is to check to make sure that nobody is is um, making weapons grade fissile material that's part of a verification systems to make sure that everybody is at zero and doesn't go beyond and build nuclear weapons after um, but part of that is also you know what do we do when with the material from the nuclear weapons that can't be converted to some kind of energy at least not at this point so it's a very good question and you know, if you're interested in that and want to work on it, we would all love it. <laughs> that's, that's all I've been thinking about. Most most of this talk is like, where is this, the, the more of this that they produce, it feels like it's not going to ever go away. And I, I work really closely with holistic doctors here um, out near Malibu. And I'm really fascinated with the effects of the environment on our health. And I just found out recently that I have radiation in my lungs from eating tuna, which is a big reason why I joined this because I, you know, I can see it on a more massive scale why this is such a huge problem. Mm -hmm. um, because it's affecting so many people's health in ways that they don't even realize, you know. So. Yeah, and that's, I'm, yeah, that's a really good point. I'm, I'm glad that they're, you're so interested because I, I know that you probably can do a lot to get us to a place where we're not poisoning ourselves. Um, and I know that there's also something called the Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty um, that has been trying to get off, get on its feet um, that would kind of ban some of the production of some of this material. So not only are we are we going to say you know, no weapons, but also let's, let's get a lid on the material as well. And, and I just would like to add that Mary Olson, who had to leave, it was her partner's birthday today, um, she, had, she spent 27 years working on nuclear waste. So she, you can follow up with her. Her information is on that link that we put in the chat. She'd love, okay. she'd love to have you involved with her. She okay. really wants to have young people joining her and taking up this research because there's so much more that needs to be done. So I would encourage you to follow up with, with Mary and, okay. also, and also to say that when the Soviet Union and when Kazakhstan dismantled its nuclear weapons, the United States and Kazakhstan collaborated on, on dismantling the weapons, removing them, and then converting, as Jessica was talking about, um, but the issue of nuclear waste is going to be with us for not only generations. For, it feels like forever. It's, 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 <laughs> it goes into geological time. Yeah. So it's, it's time span. So it's nonetheless, but, but we, we need to still get rid of the weapons and convert as much as we can. Although, you know, different people have different positions on nuclear power, as Jessica managed, uh, ma mentioned. Um, but we, it, it is a problem that we've created that is going to be with us into geological time, time span. Yeah, that's what I'm feeling really heavily, this whole conversation. And I think this work that you guys are doing and everyone is doing is so important. We have to do the first steps or, you know, so... Thank you for your question. Kekesha, I saw that your hand was raised. Yeah, I just wanted to very quickly add that I think it's also important that when we talk about nuclear disarmament to address the problem of nuclear colonialism and how uh, the mining of the waste as well as the dumping of the waste very often happens on indigenous lands uh, and that and most people don't know that the uranium that went into making uh, Fat Man and Little Boy actually was mined by the Den uh, community uh, Dene workers in the Great Bear Lakes in Canada. And so the deaths that were caused were not just the thousands in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also in the Great Bear Lake because the workers there didn't know that it was uh, radioactive material and they car hand carried and transported the material from the mine to the site. So I think it's really important that 
we also uh, discuss this when we talk about nuclear disarmament and that really should come into the mainstream. So nuclear disarmament should come into the mainstream and as well as nuclear colonialism. So just wanted to mention that. Keisha, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Uh, it's so important. And we're, Sarah, also, and for all of you who are still here, we're going to be doing a session that focuses on what Keisha just brought up, um, the disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons on indigenous peoples and peoples of color. And we're going to be addressing uranium mining, nuclear testing, nuclear waste, nuclear weapons. So that's coming up in the next couple months, and you'll be on our mailing list. And I would encourage you to be part of that conversation because there'll, there'll be a lot of people there who are also doing this work on this issue. Um, so I'm gonna, there's one, I see one more hand raised and we're gonna take the final question and then, because I know the mentors need to get on to the rest of their weekend. Thank you all for staying. Um, Kayla has your hand, you have your hand raised. Um, so I just wanted to add to the nuclear waste issue. When the big tsunami that was in the Southern hemisphere that started from Australia and it went up Samoa and um, uh, Thailand. There was a huge tidal wave that went, uh, to the, the wave went off the coast of um, uh, Samoa. And what was seen is that the US had buried all of these tins of nuclear waste that were not secure right off the coast of the island. And when the wave went out, people saw those tins that were buried off the coast in the ocean that would have very soon opened up and completely polluted the world's oceans with nuclear waste. And they removed them and buried them elsewhere. What Kekesha was talking about with the colonialism the U.S. wanted to bury a lot of the nuclear waste in Central Australia. It was just a couple of years ago from, uh, from nuclear power plants. And um, Australia, there was a, the government level and there was the populist level in Australia kicked it down, the people, because the government was going to accept it for the funds, but the people didn't want it buried in the middle of Australia. And so... It's a really serious issue, but the thing is, from what I understand, we could dismantle it, if, just like solar power. If we put the money into, um, into the technology to, um, to break it down, we could do that. It's just like so many other things, and then there are crazy ideas like burying it on the far side of the moon that have come up. So it's a really big, it's a big issue the nuclear waste and what it's doing uh, across the earth still, because it's, we still use nuclear power plants and we're still creating the waste. And the, the waste could be used to power the plants is the thing, if we really got ecological. Thank you all for staying on those of you who have continued with us and for being present for this really important conversation on the UN day for the total elimination of nuclear weapons. I'm so grateful again, especially to you mentors who stayed on for this post session chat. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. Natalia, are you still here? She's had to go. Um, yes, I'm here. Oh, I just and I and just for your again for bringing forward the work with the CYG, you know, I just want to end on a really positive note that that started with something like six or eight Russian and American students from Stanford and from Russia, and that was in I think the year 2016. This CYG group was to ban nuclear testing, and it now has I think over 900 members from all over the world of young people who are working together. That are, that are actually working on even more than nuclear testing. As you said, it's brought you into a community of people that um, is, is growing and growing. So there's a great community of people out there with Kekasha, with Jessica, and Beyond the Bomb and Glo Global Zero, and with the CYG and Openal for you, Sarah, and anyone else who's still on the call. There's so much to be done. And um, so again, visit the website where you can be in touch. And, and get involved because we need you. Thank you so much, all of you. Blessings to you on this day. Thank you for having the courage to be here. Aloha, as we say in Hawaii.
Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Joe, I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> Mwah. Mwah. Elizabeth, are you still here? Cynthia, I said I was so happy to see you. <laughs> Karen and Lauren and I mean, Cheryl, I don't know some of you, but the Arlene, wow, I haven't seen you in years. So I just thank you so much, you dear ones, all of you, see on. Um, all of you who are still here, Cheryl, Puna, Auntie, you've been with us the whole time. Thank you for blessing the session. Thank you for blessing the session. I didn't. I, know. I'm a I'm a big Bill Perry fan. Also, <clears throat> I took both of his MOOCs. Um, I'm I was I'm a uh, retiree from Stanford University, so I heard about his MOOC. I signed up and learned a great deal and scared the pants off me, which of course is what was his purpose, was to scare us into, into uh, doing something. Right. So I'm doing it through the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Oh, that's wonderful. I love which that. Which is, you know, it's 105 years old, but we, <laughs> we've been working against war since 1915. Thank you so much for doing that. But uh, anyway, so I, I thank you and, and we'll hear the schedule for your future sessions. Yes, you'll be getting emails about it. Right. And then people can join if they miss this one, if I forward that. Yeah, we'll send the recording out. We want to build. Everybody should bring somebody else. We'll encourage right. everybody to do that next time. I, will. I did tell my Wolf Disarm Committee about this, but um, and I'll tell them about the next one. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much, Puna. Thank you for being at my side again, for holding the space. Can't hear you. It's been so wonderful to witness the unfolding and the intention of all of these beautiful women. Thank you, Tom, for making this a reality. Um, it's been incredible. You know, when I think about what our ancestral beliefs remind us, to look at the past, to appreciate all that the past has offered us, and you see the wisdom of the past coming through all these young people. Uh, the ability to have them connect instantly um, through this technology has been incredibly amazing to witness. And that is what I believe all of us are really witnessing the opportunity of change, change that comes naturally like a breath. You know, to see the whole entire world be a part of this breath of intention. Um, you know, when I said earlier about the blanket of peace that we're a part of, everyone comes to our earth with some value and some ability to share, share a part of who they are. When I asked everyone to breathe into their hands at the very beginning, it was to unite everyone through this one breath. We have this one world, and it is our responsibility, our kuleana, to take care of it. But we can't do it alone. So to see the questions being asked, the questions being answered, and the people who are doing this, to be witness to this is huge. It's what prophecy has spoken about. It continues to tell us that even though we are in the time of the 
apocalypse, it is not the end of the world. It is the end of what we knew the world to be. And we have the opportunity to be the reset button. You have to start the conversation and to create the opportunity to make things even better this time around. So I thank all of you. I thank you, Tom, for make, helping us to keep the connection. But most especially, you know, Cynthia, it is through your effort and your fortitude and your vision that our ability to help you help us do the work that's necessary. It's like a, a drop of water that just keeps on vibrating. And it's through that vibration that we are part of the reality. So thank you, mahalo, mahalo puya oi for, for allowing us to be in this time and to see the world um, evolve, evolve in such a positive, uh, intentional way. Mahalo. I couldn't do it without you. So um, <laughs> mahalo. Aloha, everyone. Aloha, dear. Aloha, dears. Aloha, everyone.